these two days are a coming together of, um, of uh, two institutions that I really respect. Uh, consciousness Studies at JFK University and uh, Original Face Video. I think both of these institutions are at the leading edge of a society. They're like pseudopods that reach out to touch what is living truth at that moment in the culture. Later we're going to take questions and dialogue, but I thought for a while anyway I just reflect and I'm I'm risking not out of irresponsibility but out of the feeling that the more spontaneous the moment, the more fully we will be here together, I'm risking not coming with prepared material. I think you have seen in these past two days different stages of growth, not only the disappearance of the growth, <laughs> but uh, different stages of uh, my own journey, uh, my own spiritual journey, which is still very much ongoing and stretches on in an unknown distance in which I've stopped counting. In the old days, I used to have some estimate of when I'd get enlightened. <laughs> but that has long gone, and I've learned patience, and I will... Actually, I'm... Uh... I wish I had the longing of a, uh, a Rumi or a Kabir uh, to be done, but I don't. I'm a little more like Hanuman in many ways, but in this particular way. Hanuman is a monkey. I don't know whether all of you know about Hanuman, but Hanuman is my Ishtadev, or my, in Hinduism, my, um, that face of God that is my own lineage. And Hanuman is a monkey, which accounts for my somewhat simian qualities. Uh, and Hanuman is a monkey that is, he's really a, he's a, a very high saint in the form of a monkey. And he is serving Ram, who is God, and that's why my name is Ram Das, which means servant of Ram, which is another name for Hanuman. And he serves Ram, and it is a form of uh, bhakti, or devotional yoga, in which the relation of the um, of the devotee to God is that of servant to master. There are other forms like lover to beloved or a child to father, child to mother, like like Ramakrishna's relation to Kali, for example. That's very different. That is not a service relationship. But Hanuman lives only to serve Ram. And he serves him incredibly because he is so one-pointed one in his love of God that he gains immense power that he can do almost anything because of the intensity of his devotion. And he, um, the, the drama, which I won't spell out in great detail, uh, involves the fact that Ram's wife Sita has been stolen away by the bad guy, Ravana, who's really a good guy in drag, I mean, but that's another story. And um, Hanuman goes looking for Sita, and he takes Ram's ring with him to give to Sita if he finds her. And Sita is living out in the world like we are, in a way. And she's living in a very worldly place, which is the sort of demon loka in the Ramayana, which is the name of this holy book. 
And Hanuman is really going from God to remind Sita, who in this case is a devotee of Ram, she's not wife and devotee, to remind the devotee who's lost in the world or caught in the world that God has not forgotten her. And he brings the ring as reassurance that that has not happened. And that act of coming out into the world and bringing reassurance that the spirit is still alive and well, if you will, and that you are still connected and you haven't lost it, is such a treasure from Ram's point of view, from God's point of view, that when Hanuman comes back to Ram, Ram embraces him and says, what you've done, there's no way I can repay you. This is God speaking to, to Hanuman. I can never repay you for what you've done. I mean, you are as dear to me as my brother, Bharat. And Hanuman is kneeling before Ram. And at this point, Ram leans over to lift Hanuman up, to put him on the seat beside him, with the idea that it's like the merging with God. It's like the union. And Hanuman makes himself into stone and he pushes against God in order to keep that distance so he can stay separate, so he can remain in the relation of a devotee to God rather than merging. Because when you merge, it's all over. The rush, it's the end of it. <laughs> and uh, Hanuman, Ram says, what can I do for you? What do you want, Hanuman? He tries giving him jewels. A beautiful jewel necklace and Hanuman takes them in his teeth and bites them apart and throws them aside and somebody said how can you do that Hanuman throw those jewels aside those are very costly jewels he says they're of no use at all because they don't have Ram's name written on them anywhere see I mean he's so one pointed and one of the other devotees says well Hanuman if, if you think that why don't you throw your body away and at that point Hanuman rips his body open and there on every bone and sinew is written Ram 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 you see and then Hanuman heals his body. I mean, Ram touches his body and it's all healed. And what uh, Ram says, what can I do for you, Hanuman? I'll do anything. And Hanuman says, what I would like is to be always your devotee. I would like always to be present when the Ramayana is recited and I'd just like to be eternally your devotee. And that is an interesting, it's remaining in dualism. And it's very interesting that there are stages in the spiritual journey where it feels like such an incredible uphill journey where you lose it. Oh, I lost it. I've fallen. I've, I used to know. I used to be high back in the 60s and then I lost it. <laughs> I mean, that's a very common theme. And, uh, and what happened? I mean, I got married and the kids and the insurance and the car payments and I don't know what happened. I lost it. Well, it's absurd. You don't lose it. I mean, where can you go? It just is you got probably a little pseudo high first. You got a little higher than you were and you have to go back and clean up your act a little bit and get your ground because you don't go into the totality pushing away any part of your life. And if you try to push away your earth or your worldly connections or your grounding, send them around again, Sam. You know, I mean, it doesn't happen that way. You've got to keep going around and around until you're not pushing and pulling. And um, as it gets lighter and as you start to delight, there gets a point where it starts to be very playful. I mean, even the hard parts are playful, which is really strange. And it starts to become um, like dancing or floating or surfing or something like that. Life, the stuff of life. Because the balance went from where you're in the world really lost. I want this, I don't want this, I have an opinion about this, I don't like that. Give me, don't give me, you did this to me, you, you know, things like that. I don't have enough money, I, my body's decaying, all those things. <laughs> and it's all real. And in the midst of all those screaming trumpets, there might be the tiniest little sound of the flute, the inner, the still small voice within that the Quakers talk about. The little tiny voice that says, uh, that's not all there is. You know, and you say, oh, shut up. You know, you don't realize how tough it is being alive. You know? <laughs> See, and it's at first you just kind of ignore that little voice. It's, 
it's the tiniest little whisper of, of uh, equanimity in the midst of all the Sturm und Drang of what all. And then, uh, over time, that little thread gets stronger and stronger and stronger. The image I uh, often have is that story, you know, I just recently told it in a lecture, um, of the man that's imprisoned in a tower and his wife is trying to get him out and they won't let her in, of course, and so she gets a beetle and ties a silk thread to the beetle and sends the beetle up and the beetle keeps climbing up until it gets to the top of the tower. And then the husband pulls in the silk thread and then she ties a little string to the silk thread and then a rope to the, the string. Finally, he's got a rope and he climbs down and escapes. And in a way, that's a little bit what it's like. At first, there's just this little teeny thread of consciousness. And it only happens now and then. You flicker into awareness that this isn't quite, the worldly trip isn't quite what it's all about. And then through a whole set of circumstances that are a process of evolution of the individual consciousness, that little thread becomes a string and the string becomes a rope and the percentage of time you get lost in the world starts to diminish. And there's a critical moment when it becomes less than 50%. I mean, as long as it's more than 50, it still seems like you're caught in the world. And then it starts to go down until pretty soon your faith gets strong enough that you are, in essence, a spiritual being who's living in the world, which is what Christ is talking about when he says you are in the world but not of the world. And that becomes such a deep faith in you that you can breathe a sigh of relief. It's like you're home. You're beginning to go home now. You've turned the corner and the panic starts to leave you, that terrible panic of I'm going to lose it and it's going to be terrible. And then it's interesting what happens because as that you turn that corner and you start to get that stronger faith, it goes faster and faster. The rope gets stronger and stronger and the reality of the spirit gets greater and greater and then you start to push against it because you want to enjoy it for a while because it's so nice because you look around and you're so in love with everybody. It's like everywhere you look is your beloved. And that's quite a different thing from I love you, but I don't really care for you. It's a different level of consciousness you're playing from. And you just look out and it's so loving. And the it's all so delightful. And you're appreciating the kind of the way of things, the Tao, the harmony of things. And then you get like Hanuman pushing against God. You say, well, not just yet. You know, it's like extending the foreplay. You know, <laughs> some of you may understand that. That's a, <laughs> an esoteric reference. <laughs> One of the things that um, that I have sensed more and more is a term that's very, very hard for me to communicate to people because every time I say it, I feel the kind of resistance to even thinking the term, um, which is the word perfection. That the way of things is just the way it's supposed to be. And that is a real stinker. I mean, it, and everybody throws up to oneself. I mean, when you say perfection, Part of me says, what do you mean perfection? Look at and look at and look at, look at nuclear paranoia and misery. Look at exploitation. Look at, you call that perfect? And it's very delicate to deal with that concept. And... Um, See if I can, today I spent the afternoon with a fellow who has AIDS. Now his body is, we were talking about how sometimes one sickness after another, they just keep coming one after another until finally you just kind of cry and sob because you just had enough. I mean, you just, oh, another one, oh, another one, oh, another one, it's just so much. And I was looking at what was causing the suffering in him. 
Now, this is a heavy-duty one. And I saw that what was causing the suffering was his attachment to his model of who he was. I mean, if you look at the things you go through, you, you grow and you go through puberty and then you have love affairs and they break up and then you have economic this and that and all that stuff. And a lot of the times you can say, well, that's okay, that's part of the process of life. Usually when you're in the midst of them, you don't say that. You say, oh, if it was only different than this, if I only had enough money, if this relationship is only working out, if you always have a model of how you wish it were other than the way it is. And there is a little flip that occurs when you look at things just the way they are without expectation and without model of letting go of expectation and letting go of model. You can have them around, but you don't hold the attachment to them. I mean, for this fellow this afternoon, the existential fact is there he was lying on the bed, sweating, nausea, some bleeding, pain. Models of himself, of who he used to be, pictures on the wall of who he was, not who he is now. Constantly comparing. That comparison is constantly re cre recreating the suffering of the model of who he is. And if you have a model of life as something that has no suffering in it, no unexpected reverses, nothing that you didn't plan for, look at how much suffering you're in for. You can see it. Because life isn't like that. And one of the things that Buddha taught was the continuous quality of change of all form in the universe, of which your body and your life expectancy and your mind and the social situation and the world situation, all of that is changing, constantly changing. So that every time your mind grabs hold of a model of who you are, where you're going, an expectation that it's going to be a certain way, you're just asking for suffering. Can you hear, is this, I mean, this may be obvious to all of you, but it's, it's a place that I get caught a lot, very subtly. And I was watching today, and I kept saying to this fellow, well, here we are. I mean, be here now, so to speak. And uh, I said, just open, let's open, and open to the sweating. Just allow the sweating to be. Here it is, we're all sweating. Sweating is, and a little bleeding is, and there's some pain and nausea. It's all is, and there's the sound of the refrigerator, and there's my voice, and I'm here, and we're two awarenesses sharing the dilemma of incarnation together. And as we talked, he went from busy being a sweating, nauseous, frightened person to being a completely peaceful open, present being. And it took about, I'd say, about four minutes. Now, he trusted me. I mean, he had written me a letter, and I answered, and I came. And he trusted me, and so that when I started to guide that meditation, he just went with it right away. I just sat on the bed, and I held him, and I just went through this thing, this meditation with him. Now, I thought... When I leave the room, he's going to grab back again because he's got the pictures on the walls. He's got all the stuff that's going to reinforce that idea of if I didn't have this damn sickness, I could mm, or mm, or mm, mm, mm. And my heart goes out to a human being whose mind creates their own suffering. I mean, you say, is the AIDS itself the suffering or is the mind in relation to the AIDS the suffering? Is the fact that I am bald the suffering or is it my mind in relation to my baldness that might create suffering? I mean, when I went bald, I've told this many times, but when I was going bald, I was busy not going bald. <laughs> I was a person with hair that was obviously losing it. And you know what I did. I got a long strand and I sort of did this thing to it and I stood it with the wind and the wind I would stand like this. And 
I was busy holding on to a model of who I was a moment before. Just recently, I, um, I had perhaps one of the greatest gifts of my life. I had five months of nursing my stepmother through cancer to her death. And she died in my arms. And she was a tough lady. And she was very independent, and she she knew she was a woman of spirit, but not in any um, way of, she hadn't thought about it a lot. She just had a deep spiritual essence to her. But she and I didn't always get along too well, but we did pretty well. I mean, I didn't stay around too much, but we did pretty well. And then she got sick. And at first, there was all uh, holding on to who she was. I mean, she controlled the house, and she'd be in bed and very weak, so that I would start to take over the house. So in the kitchen, there were things like that. She had collected these seashells, and she kept them around the sink all the time. And they were always in the way when you did the dishes. Okay. So now, as I moved in and started to take over the kitchen, I sort of put the shells a little bit to the side. And she came in in her wheelchair one day. And she got furious because the shells weren't there. Because she felt like she was being deposed. This was her home, right? I mean, you hear the issue. And then I watched as the process went on and the suffering deepened and the letting go went until pretty soon we started to grow together and we were like becoming lovers. We would lie in the bed holding each other and just talk. We'd talk about death and what it was going to be like after death. And, and we were putting in catheters and being carried to the toilet and making milkshakes and doing all the process until finally that room was like a beautiful ashram. It was one of the most peaceful spaces. I mean, we all loved hanging out in that room. It was just absolutely so gentle. And she had converted, transformed into being this very soft, present being. She had let go of this mind that grabbed and held so tightly. We just got softer and softer and softer until her death was just a whisper of oh, just letting go at that moment. She sat up, she took three breaths, and she left. And I watched this woman who four months before, I had models of keep your distance, be careful, because she can blow up, she's very volatile. And then watching and seeing how my ability to let go of my models of who she was allowed the process to happen so much faster. I mean, my father, who I take care of now, he's 88. And he, when, he, when we were growing up, he was very busy with his own career. And he was a, a, a father that protected us and provided for us, but he didn't have much time for us. And he was a little bit remote. And my brothers didn't have much tremendous love for him, actually. I mean, they might have loved him, but they really had a hard time. They, they were feeling, they were judging him as having not been a good enough father. And somewhere along the way, I just started letting go of models. And he has changed. He's had some minor strokes. He's just like the Buddha now. I mean, he just sits there and smiles all the time. And he's, he's absolutely beautiful. He's totally happy. I've never seen a, a happier being in my life. I mean, he can pass out and vomit. And you look at him and he's smiling. I mean, it's just incredible. I say, does it bother you? The vomit's on? No. And he's sharp as a tack. I mean, he's not lost it. I said to him, you gave $750 to the temple last year. What would you like me to give this year? He said, 350 I mean, this is somebody who's out of it most. Everybody says, too bad about your father. He's not there anymore. The hell he isn't there. He's, he's, he's just 88. He doesn't care to play most of the time. That's, I don't blame him, to tell you the truth. He sees through it all by now. <laughs> but what I've now got is this relationship with this totally beautiful present being. And I was talking to a therapist, and I said, you know, I don't have much sense of history. They, he said, when were we together last? I said, I have no idea when we were together last. He said, was it three or four? I said, I don't know. I said, you know, this man that I'm with now, who is my father, I don't remember who he was anymore. I mean, it's just, he says, well, do you think that's exactly healthy? <laughs> uh, 
I mean, you can hear that edge, you know. I mean, are you really dealing with your father properly? But what's happened is we're living in the present moment, not in what was. And people come into the house continually and say, they remember my father as having been, uh, he founded Brandeis University, he was uh, co-founded Einstein Medical School, he was a president of a railroad, I mean, he was a real mover and shaker and had lots of stories and a tremendous rich life. And now it's all gone, he's just here. And everybody says, isn't it too bad? Too bad is a model of who he was. I think who he is is much nicer than who he was. I don't think it's too bad at all. Now, that's pushing the edge a little bit. Can you hear? I mean, I really want to push things a little bit with us. So when I talk about perfection, I'm saying open to just what is. And that fellow today suffers much less when he just allows what is to be for the moment. He can still do his visualizations. He can work to change it. But the holding that discrepancy between what is and what he wishes were is constantly creating suffering for him. And for all of us, continually, continually. Another thing I want to talk about, I'm not going to try to be uh, cohesive. I'd like to just play a little bit tonight and talk about things as they come to my mind. Is this, is this all right, the way I'm doing this? Yeah. Is that our attachment to our senses, our seeing, our hearing, our smelling, our touching, our t tasting, and to our thinking mind, our thinking. These are the, the vehicles through which we're used to receiving information. And they keep us focused on form all the time on things. And because we live in a world of form or things, we tend to think of ourselves as form and things. And there is a very deep Western predisposition to identify with your thoughts and think you are your thoughts. That who you think you are is who you are. Now, just imagine that you are a large blob and that one tiny bit of that blob is form. And there is another part, a much larger part, that is formless. But how would you know about it? You can't hear it. You can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't even think about it because thinking by its nature thinks about something. It takes an object. And what this part of you that has no form is, it's not an object. So how would you know of its existence? And if you can't, if you are totally attached to the fact that the only way you can know about what is, is through your senses and your thinking mind, you decide that that, that part of you that has no form isn't. Now, this is a very, um, this, is a, this is about as deep as mysticism gets, actually. Like when Einstein said, and I've quoted this many times, when he said, I didn't arrive at my understanding of the primary laws of the universe, those understanding of those relationships, through my rational mind. What I understand him to have meant was that he went beyond his thinking mind 
and beyond his sense experiences. And he went into, here's where the words start to fall apart. He went into some way of being with what is. Heinlein talks about it as grokking, where you become one with it. There's no longer subject-object. There's no longer thinking about. There's no longer relationship. It is as if I am it. He became E equals MC squared. And then he came back and he articulated it because he was a physicist. In the same way Bach went and became music and then comes back and imperfectly, pretty good, but still the const that what comes to the human ear isn't the divine sound. He articulates the Brandenburg Concerti or whatever. Or Mozart or Da Vinci or Michelangelo or who Picasso. Blake. It feels to me very much like we are like the drunk. The image that's very familiar by now to everybody has been used so much. The drunk who's looking for the watch under the street light and everybody says they help him and then they say, well, where'd you lose the watch? And he's set up in the alley. They say, well, why aren't you looking there? He says, because there's more light here. <laughs> but you don't find the watch. And the thing is, when you keep looking for the deepest truths of your being, through your senses and your thinking mind because that's what you're used to using you don't find what you're looking for and you always feel like you're one thought away from where the action is you always feel slightly cut off from being in the moment being here fully because it is not what here is I mean and yet what's bizarre is we are all functioning with that intuitive non-conceptual information all the time but we have no way of noticing that we're doing it and therefore we relegate it to irrelevance is this too weird or are you hearing what I'm saying I mean I am convinced now on those studies that show how many people had mystical experiences Staggering numbers of people have had mystical experiences, but most of them have treated them as irrelevant or trivial. Or I was out of my mind, or I was drunk, or I didn't know what happened, or I went to the movie and I was confused, or whatever. They have ways of, of denigrating it, of treating it as irrelevant, because they cannot gain conceptual control of it. They can't get control of it with their minds all the time. Now, what is scary is when you recognize that the vast part of yourself is not conceptual and is not knowable by the usual methods of knowing, that in a sense you can be it, but you can't know it. It's like the Tao says, the student learns by daily increments. You learn a little each day. The way is gained by daily loss. Loss upon loss until, ah, the way. You clean away the conceptual structures. You clean them away, you clean them away, you clean them away until... It's like regaining innocence or having innocence. The innocence of being just with what is, without the conceptual overlay, without the control that comes from knowing you know. I mean, look at how wedded we are to science as a religion which says what we, what we want to do is build a body of knowledge so we know we know. But what happens if the major stuff of which our happiness and ultimate survival and existence, if that is rooted in something that you can't know you know, what are we going to do? What if it is not amenable to the scientific method? What are we going to do then? Should we reject it? Or is it possible for us to become, to train ourselves, to discipline ourselves, to go beyond our own mind, our own thinking mind, to go beyond our own attachment to our senses and our thinking mind? Is it possible for us, see, 
Western cognitive psychology doesn't deal with this at all, by the way. It talks about what you think about. It assumes an identity between you and the thinker. Cogito ergo sum. But just imagine now, how are you going to get through to that part of yourself which is not knowable by your mind, by your thinking mind, by your analytic intellect? Without putting your intellect down, it's a beautiful servant but a lousy master. And you treat it as a master most of the time in order to sort of control the universe. It's wonderful to be able to think. It's too bad if you can't stop it. It's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. It just keeps going on and on and on and on. You can't stop it. When I, after some years of spiritual practice, when I started to not think, my first reaction, having been a... I mean, when I was a professor at Harvard, thinking was the stuff I got paid for. And I remember, I mean, I couldn't waste time not thinking. I remember flying, and I had a little uh, Cessna airplane, and I was flying across the United States, and I had a clipboard on my thigh so I could write down significant thoughts while I was flying, so I wouldn't waste time flying and not thinking all the time, because I could think up research proposals to put into NIH, NIMH. And when I first started to not think, when, when I first would have these moments where I just was, my mind was empty. When I started to think again, the first thought was, uh-oh, I took too many drugs. I think I've blown my brain. There it goes. Too bad. Oh, God. Well, they were right. They were right after all. And I got frightened because ever since I was a child, I was taught thinking is better. Think more, you're better. And your analytic mind can solve all problems. And look what a mess it has created for us. Look what a mess it creates. Because it doesn't recognize the deeper harmony that exists and the deeper unity that exists across peoples and between us and nature, all those levels. It just doesn't do it. It tries to figure it all out. And look what it does. Every act it does to try to heal it, it keeps creating more problems. And at first, when I started not to, to notice I wasn't thinking, I got frightened, as you can see. And then I remember going through the next stage where I thought, well, if that's what's happened, that's what's happened. I've blown my mind. What am I going to not worry about it? I mean, that's the way it is. I'll just be sort of a dull normal from here on in. And I'll just be whatever it is that I'm going to be from here on in. And then I began to notice that even though my mind was empty, when something was necessary, when I wasn't too frightened to block it and flick a flicker, if I just trusted it, when I needed it, it was there without my constantly rehearsing it all the time. I mean, you, I used to go down the street, you know, and you'd look and you'd say, there's books and there's a camera and there's a, you know, a shoe and there's a tree and there's a car. I mean, your mind is constantly doing that. You're constantly reassuring yourself you know that the world is out there the way you think it is and your mind can't stop it's like this incredible addiction to labeling so you think you know you know where you are in this complete and it's really whistling in the dark and what's so frightening about dying for many people is that they are going to lose the control of their thinking mind they can't think their way through that one. And they know that at some point their thinking mind's going to let go. And then what? And that's why in the Eastern traditions, you spend your life learning how to extricate yourself from your thinking mind and from your identification with your senses so that at the moment of death, there isn't that panic of loss of control because you've already died. And when Christ said, lest ye die, ye cannot be born again, we're talking about that. We're talking about dying into who you think you are, the dying of who you think you are, then you are what you are. This is very weird stuff I'm saying. And I mean, if you were just walked in from outside, it would sound like a 
course in psychosis by a, a, a case. <laughs> I remember I told I remember speaking at Einstein Medical School once. The young Turk psychiatrist invited me to speak there. Some years back, and I had a beard, and I was wearing a dress, and I had a lot of beads. <laughs> and um, the grand rounds where I was speaking, it turned out that they alternated days. They had a speaker, and then the next day they'd present a case, and then they'd have a speaker, and they'd present a case. <laughs> so I came in, and uh, and I. The only, all the chairs were very narrow, so the only comfortable place for me to sit like this was on the conference table. So I sat on the conference table, <laughs> and I watched these old Viennese psychiatrists come in, you know, psychoanalysts, and I could see they looked at me, and they, I could feel they thought, gee, I must have mis, I mean, obviously this is the case, you know. And, <laughs> so seeing their predicament, I presented myself as a case. I talked about how. He took psychotropic chemicals and had hallucinations, which is the way they'd say it. And uh, they kept nodding until they realized the patient was presenting itself. <laughs> it was sort of the. <laughs> now, just the models of, like, who am I? Who am I? For example, Ramana Maharshi, one of the great Indian saints, teaches something called Vichara Atma, which is the form of what's called neti neti, which means not that, not that. And he says, he helps you. If you've got the discipline of mind, which is a form of what's called jnana yoga, you are able to extricate yourself from identification with each thing. like. For example, I am not this arm. And then you just see the arm as an object. You don't see it as me. It's just that arm. And so you say, I am not my organs of motion. I am not my organs, my inner organs. And you go through step by step. In each case, you extricate yourself from identification with that. I am not my feelings. I am not, I am not, I am not. You're pulling back and back and back. And the last one is, I am not this thought. Which thought? The thought, I am not this thought, which is the last one you got. See? And that's like climbing up a tree and then out on a branch and then out on a twig and then cutting off the twig, you see. Usually your mind flicks at that point in your back being your body. I mean, it's very hard. It's a tough discipline to do yana yoga. And in a way, when the, the Zen koan, the, where you're confronted with something that your rational mind can't solve, is another way of yana yoga of forcing you to go beyond your thinking mind, to go outside of it. So what is the sound of the one hand clapping or how do you know your Buddha nature through the sound of a cricket or whatever? And you keep trying, your mind keeps wrestling with it, wrestling with it. I mean, I, when I was taking the Rohatsu Dai Sashin, a nine day hell course, um, <laughs> Where you got a five days, five times a day, you go into the the master. Ah, doctor, how you know your Buddha nature through sound of cricket? And you say anything, you know, you say, whatever. And he, oh, doctor, I am so disappointed in you. I had such hopes for you. You seemed so promising. Ah, so and he rings your bell and you dismiss and you go crushed back to, you. and you got to run back to your sitting mat sit like this and if you wobble they beat you it's, it's really quite intense <laughs> and I got sick and it was cold and miserable and I hated all of them and I hated me and I was trying to escape and I couldn't think of how to get out of it with safe face <laughs> and about the fifth day when I was running a fever and I was absolutely miserable I was walking up to the uh, to the interview with another lame thing I would thought up to say <laughs> and I finally thought screw it I don't really care. <laughs> and I looked around and everything was radiant and beautiful. And I walked in, ah, doctor, how you know your Buddha nature through sound of cricket? Good morning, Roshi. Ah, now you are becoming beginning student of Zen. <laughs> it was the moment of letting go of the mind and just, 
Ah, this moment, this moment here. I am first time I've seen you today. Good morning. I can't use it the second time. You can't go in. <laughs> Good afternoon, Roshi. See? <laughs> you can only milk it once, but it's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> You'll forget. <laughs> now, uh, uh, what I've been doing recently is um, doing Vipassana meditation with a Burmese master. I just got back from Hawaii last week where I was sitting for 10 days. And last summer I sat for two months in a in uh, Yekta, a uh, monastery in Burma, Rangoon. And in that monastery, you figure from 3 in the morning till 11 at night, you are sitting in your cell, following the muscle rising and falling in your abdomen. Every time you breathe in, it, it does something, and you know it rising. Every time you breathe out, you know falling. What you are doing by doing that is you are picking a primary object. You're picking a thing. It's like taking the mind, which is used to having the freedom to go here and grab this and think that and feel this and sense that and touch that and remember this and plan that and all that stuff. And the mind's always going that. And that's what gives you your solidity of your universe. And it's happening so fast, it always seems solid. It's like a movie film in which the frames, all of which are dissociated, but if they go by fast enough, it seems like there's a, there's a real being there doing something. And so we keep re reinforcing everything. I mean, it's just flickering around. There's just so much information all the time, and your, your awareness is just flickering from thing to thing. Because you're only thinking of one thing at a time, it turns out. Your awareness is only focused on one thing at a time. But it goes so fast. It goes at the rate, Buddha said it went at the rate of one trillion per blink of an eye. That's pretty fast. Now, that is only fast from the time dimension that your mind is in, it turns out. I mean, this is really playing now with what's called living time. Hold that for a moment. I'll come back to it. So you take a primary object. It's like taking a wild elephant and tying one of those rings around its foot and a, a cable and then putting a stake in the ground and you're going to bring the elephant down, you're going to tame it to carry logs or whatever. And your mind isn't used to having any controls on it at all. And all your rule is, you've made an agreement, you've come there and you've made a conscious intentional choice that you are going to try to keep your mind fixed on this little muscle going up and down from 3 in the morning until 11 at night every day for two months. Seven days a week, four hours of sleep, two meals, one at 5.30 in the morning, one at 11, nothing after noon, no, nothing but water. Nobody to talk to, no books to read, no notes to take, no place to hide. And you're under a vow of truth and each time you go in to report to the teacher, you tell how many hours you've been doing it in the past 24 hours. So that if you figure you can go into the bathroom and take an hour off and think about the stock market or think about the international situation or think about your relationships or think about what the hell you're doing here, you can't do it because you're wasting time. You're going to take it out of your sleeping time. Otherwise, you weren't meditating. So you just, it's, you're cornered like a rat. I mean, you just got to do it. And you're doing this voluntarily, you understand. I mean, nobody's doing this to you. It's, it's incredible. And you, I saw how slimy my mind was. I mean, it is so slithery. You try to get it to stay somewhere, and it goes there, and then it goes, boom, and then slithers here and slithers there. And then it begins to think about meditation. That's a good one. That sucks you in. <laughs> okay. And there are all these ways you watch how creative the mind is in keeping you being somebody doing something. Because if you were only following rising and falling of the breath, where would you be since you're a thought? Finally, there is only the rising and the falling of the breath. That's all there is in the universe. There isn't even you watching your breath rising and falling, which is a thought about it. 
And so you do this for a long time, and first your mind stays there, and then it goes off and goes off, and pretty soon, I mean, years back when I started to do this meditation, 12 years ago, I could go off and I could have a six-hour fantasy, a six-hour sexual fantasy, <laughs> sitting in Burma all by myself in a cell. I mean, and it was just with great detail and the subtleties of the rustle of silk and all the... You know, every little thing and the smells and the images and the shadows. And I just, what was the rush? I wasn't going anywhere. You know, I had <laughs> weeks to meditate and I'd look like I was meditating all the time. And they, nobody knew, you know, and I, I would have these six hour things, you know, it was like having an orgy of, or I'd plan when I became famous and, you know, I mean, I'd have those things. And when I became like the Buddha, what would I do? You know, and I'd have long fantasies of what I would be, how compassionate I'd be. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> but then, after a while, you see the finiteness of the creation of all this stuff. All of it turns out to be finite, and it's not interesting enough. I mean, the worst thing is to live out how you thought it was going to be. I mean, you look at your life, and the exciting part is that it's always slightly different. It always stretches. It's always better because it's more than you imagined it would be, even at your best imagination. Fantasy isn't nearly as great as what is. You know, I used to read fantasy. I used to read science fiction and, and um, Le Carre and all those kind of things. I mean, I used to read like I was addicted to them. And then I realized that my life was so rich. Why would I go there? And this was so much more, so much more, so much more. So after a number of years, my mind quiets down and it finally gets interested in actually doing this thing of keeping the mind focused. But the mind keeps going off and I feel like I am struggling to keep it focused and I'm angry at the method for entrapping me. And then there's some point, this was about uh, two years ago, when after about four weeks of this, I thought, I'm on the wrong side of this game. I'm identifying with the wild mind rather than with the, the point, the one-pointed mind. And something released in me, and I just started to go to the one point and just started to stay there. And I began to feel like that was home. Now, you got to remember, this is all what's known as samadhi of... Uh, in the Buddhist sense, there is uh, shila, panya, and samadhi are the three components. Shila is purifications, samadhi is concentration, and panya is wisdom. And you kind of keep working with these three things. So samadhi is concentration, and you get your mind so it will stay on one point. This is only the beginning. This is the doorway in, by the way. This isn't the thing itself. There's no big deal about keeping the mind in one place, except to do that you have broken the identification with all the other thoughts in order to do that. Okay. You with me? I mean, you hear what I'm saying? Now, once the mind becomes laser-like and starts to stay there, all the other thoughts and senses and feelings, they hang around at the periphery. I remember them being like those little bugs around a light. They just kind of flickering around there. They don't come in and take over because you don't let them do it, but they're just flickering around the edge, and your mind is just staying, rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. And there are stages where you feel peace like you never felt peace before. And I remember going to my teacher, meditation teacher once and saying, oh, thank you, I finally got it. I feel this peace, this incredible peace. Oh, that's what I've always yearned for. Oh, it's so wonderful. And he, sharply attuned as he is to spiritual materialism, <laughs> said to me, how lovely. Now go back and follow the rising and falling of your breath. Okay. Get on with it. Because each time you stop along the way to smell the pretty flower, ooh, bliss, ooh, rapture, ooh, powers, back to the breath. Oh, but I can do so much good with those powers. Back to the breath. And you, you get many choices to step off the trolley, believe me. Well, I think I got enough of this. This is really good. I mean, I really do good with this. 
I mean, the, the difference between where my consciousness is now and where it was a year ago or where it was two years ago as the result of the sadhana I've been doing in the past two years is so dramatically different. I mean, I'm speaking now from a place of such deeper being, of my being, than I have spoken from in the past. I can feel it. I know it. I mean, it may sound crazier. I don't know what it sounds like out there, but inside it's feeling really strong. And there's a tendency to say, well, gee, with this, look at what I can do. And there is where the delicacy is, because you've got to balance. Do I get off the trolley here and go do it, or do I put it back in the hopper and run it through the, the blender again? So you come back, and then once the mind gets one pointed, it becomes like a laser, and it starts to slice into reality. It starts to cut into the universe. And some of the things you see that are stages that they describe. For example, I'll just give you a couple examples because it's such a complex body of knowledge about this. I mean, if the Buddhist Tripitaka, uh, the, the analysis of the way the human mind works is so evolved. I mean, it, to me, it makes Western psychology look like, uh, like tinker toys or, you know. Um, you come to a point where, for example, when I look at this camera, I see something that's dark and shape and the arms and all of this. I see all this. Now, how do I know that those are arms and camera? It all happens so quickly that when I look, I don't any longer just see shadow, dark, light, form. I see camera and arms on the camera. I already apply the apperception, the conceptual overlay. I do it all so quickly most of the time 